Welcome to the Spark Live webinar series, one component of our Spark Knowledge Mobilization Program. Spark is Children's Healthcare Canada's shared platform for advocacy, research, and knowledge. Spark Live is where we gather each week to curate, convene, and showcase excellence and innovation from across the child and youth healthcare community. Our goal is to spark conversation, ideas, and action. Children's Healthcare Canada would like to thank our funding partners for their ongoing contributions that support all of our programs and activities, including this Spark Live bi-weekly webinar series. There are two options to join in on the live conversation. Questions and comments for our panel or presenters can be typed into the question box, or comments that you want to share with the audience can be typed into the chat box visible to all of our attendees. For those of you on Twitter, tag at ChildHealthCan on any webinar-related tweets or use the hashtag SparkLive. And to keep up to date on all of Children's Healthcare Canada's webinars and other activities, be sure to sign up for our weekly Spark News e-bulletin by visiting our website at childhealthcan.ca. Hello, everyone, and welcome to another edition of Children's Healthcare Canada's Spark Live bi-weekly webinar series. I'm Rachel Van Wuzik, your host today, and sitting in for Paula Robeson, who is on vacation. SPARK Live is one component of SPARK Knowledge Mobilization Program. SPARK stands for Children's Healthcare Canada's Shared Platform for Advocacy, Research, and Knowledge. Children's Healthcare Canada acknowledges that our offices, located in Ottawa, are on the unceded, unsurrendered territory of the Algonquin and Anishinaabeg people. We recognize and deeply appreciate their historic connection to this place. We also recognize the contributions that Métis, Inuit, and other Indigenous peoples have made, both in shaping and strengthening this community, our province, and the country. Today, we are delighted to bring you Joy Pop, finding joy and building resilience in youth through a co-developed app. This is just a reminder that we record all of our webinars. As mentioned in the intro video, please type your questions into the Q&A box at any time, and I'll prompt you via chat as well. I'll pose the questions to our speakers at the end of the session. I would now like to introduce our speakers for today, Dr. Christine Weckerly and Ashlyn Musquash. Dr. Chris Weckerly is an associate professor in pediatrics and an associate member of the Offord Center for Child Studies at McMaster University. Her research focuses on youth who have had adverse childhood experiences and their current mental health and resilience. She led the Maltreatment and Adolescence Pathways Research Study, partnered with Canada's largest child welfare agencies to track youth outcomes across adolescents. The Research to Action video in this study was runner-up in the CIHR IHD-CYH Video Talks competition. Her team grant, CIHR Team SV, focuses on the impact of sexual violence victimization among male youth and young adults, seeking to understand components of resilience and developing intervention innovations. The CIHR Team SV Research to Action video won a special prize in the CIHR Video Talks Contest for 2017. This work is ongoing with ECCAT International as a partner. Dr. Weckerly and team have developed a youth resilience app, JoyPop, to support day-to-day -day resilient functioning. Dr. Ashlyn Musquash is a clinical psychologist as well as an assistant professor in the Department of Psychology at Lakehead University and director of the Coping Research Lab. Work in this lab focuses on understanding how and why people cope with adverse experiences or stressful life events. In particular, Dr. Musquash and her team study the role that early experiences, social relationships, and individual differences have on emotion regulation and coping, and are currently leading implementation and evaluation efforts related to the JoyPop mobile mental health app. It is now my pleasure to pass the mic over to Dr. Weckerly. Thank you so much, Rachel, for that lovely introduction. And uh, just a side note, in the upcoming uh, CHRHD CYH video talks contest, we will have our entry with ECPAT on uh, child sexual exploitation among boys. Uh, so stay tuned for that. Today, though, we're going to be talking about M Health for Youth, uh, mobile uh, technology. and um, very pleased to be speaking with Ashlyn. Um, we are at JoyPop. We have a various uh, communication vehicles and invite you to join us at JoyPop underscore app on Twitter and Instagram, Facebook, etc. So we're going to be talking today about 
what uh, the promise of M Health is, mo mobile applications, and to understand some of our research on um, its application to Indigenous youth and talk about the evaluations and research to date. And first off, we're going to have a few poll questions. We'd like to have your engagement and thank you in advance for answering these. Have you ever used a mobile mental health app? Great, so uh, about half have and about half haven't. So this uh, lets us know that there is room for um, evidence-based practice in mobile mental health apps, uh, that that's a relevant area. And when we did uh, this similar sort of poll with uh, former youth in care or current youth in care, there was about 20% that were using some kind of a mental health or health app. So this is definitely an area that is developing and we're got to be a part of it. The next question. Do your clients use mobile mental health apps? Is this something, if you have practice, do you recommend or does your organization um, in, have any policy about that? So that's interesting that uh, about 71% do utilize some sort of a mobile mental health app um, and uh, encourage that with clients of those who've answered. And the last question, have you ever directed a client to use a mobile mental health app? So that you made that part of your clinical prescription per se. And that's a little, a little fewer have done so, but 63%. And I think, again, this speaks to the need for clear information on evidence-based practice as it relates to mobile mental health apps. Thank you so much for your engagement. And as we move on, So as mentioned, uh, M Health or Mobile Health includes some sort of technology devices. It can, it's, the definition is uh, sort of beyond apps to uh, instant messaging. And, um, uh, but today we're focusing on the app, mobile apps. And uh, there are various multiple approaches, as I mentioned. Uh, JoyPop uh, has a website, youthresilience.net. We have social media accounts. Uh, we have actually TikTok, uh, Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook. And we have a YouTube channel, Resilience in Youth, where there is a, Joy, a JoyPop playlist that features information, uh, youth developed, uh, knowledge mobilization, youth talking about how they use the app. Um, and for resilient, sorry, <laughs> what we're talking about in a mobile app is that this isn't going to replace therapy, but it's a positive, uh, could be a positive adjunct. So you could also think of it as a waitlist option or a booster option as well. Thank you. And we're all very much aware of COVID and that it has, in fact, uh, challenged mental health. So Statistics Canada show that there is a drop in youth reported mental health. Um, fewer youth are saying they have good, very good or excellent mental health. And the recent uh, Canadian uh, Review article shows that one in four youth post-COVID are experiencing depression, depression symptoms. And we can understand the why of that, 
not only a new anxiety like fear of contagion, but also the social isolation, the reduced access to service, and, and the burnout that youth talk about in having only online in environments to interact with, uh, especially with professionals. So this leads to increased stress and uh, challenges. If you had a mental health challenge, it's even challenged further. Uh, there is a new resource out, just out, on youth resilience created for the Good to Talk, which is part of the uh, Kids Help phone. And that link is there. It's from the Ontario Center of Excellence for Child and Youth Mental Health. And part of the stress that maybe we as adult providers aren't as um, connected to is understanding the youth culture these days and what they're experiencing. So sexting research has been um, more recent and it suggests that the mean prevalence of sending a sext is about 14.8%, whereas receiving one is 27.4%. And the U, uh, a global health um, survey that was done on uh, when COVID uh, started is they found so much more youth um, were reporting receiving unwanted uh, information, uh, unwanted bids for attention uh, online. So there are various formats that this can happen in. What this review found was the most vulnerable age for sextortion was 12 to 15 years. And um, impulsivity may, among youth may be part of that. Um, and they found that a, a link between sexting and risky sexual behaviors and other risky health behaviors. Uh, they discussed uh, uh, potential issues like peer pressure to conform as well as um, anxiety and depression with the fear that these kinds of images may resurface. And it just there uh, shows you the um, odds ratios for multiple partners, alcohol use and lack of contraception that was associated with engagement in sexting and a link to the article. So when we've done work with Indigenous youth. We will have a partnership with Six Nations of the Grand River, and uh, we've looked at how the Joy Pop app might be adapted. And uh, this was at invitation. When we look into the landscape of uh, Indigenous uh, uh, youth apps, we have a uh, done a review article and only found two that had any evidence. And then more recently, this Brave app. Uh, this uh, primarily focusing on messaging and links to uh, like videos and things like that. In this uh, RCT, they failed to find a significant change uh, with the exception of a change in help seeking efficacy among those who were reporting health risk behaviors at baseline. Next. So uh, there's our own article in the International Journal of Child and Adolescent Resilience. It's open access. Then we uh, where we're looking at uh, both conceptual models as well as the actual apps that are available. And uh, some of the uh, key points is, as you can see in this Haudenosaunee wellness model, if, um, you know, there, there's the connection to traditional um, learning study of ceremonies and also the connection to the land, um, studying language. And uh, the Haudenosaunee model would suggest that you actually put community above self so that there is a, a focus on relationships and especially Thanksgiving, which is in the great law in the Thanksgiving address that is done uh, as, a, as an ongoing all day kind of practice and especially before some kind of an event and understanding the relational importance of family and kinship, uh, clans, et cetera. And then there's this pink circle on the good mind. And that's sort of the teaching that fits in with mental health and resilience 
around having a good mind or coming together to have a good mind that can, uh, is uh, related to peace, having balance, uh, having recreation. So this idea of uh, a good mind is something that uh, we talk about in this article. So the, the app opportunities are seen as helpful because they are relatively low cost. Um, the user can really fit need to action. And they offer uh, multiple opportunities. There are apps that are single, like CBT for depression, uh, single focused, but others, and some for sleep, some for meditation, but not very many apps have been designed for youth or have used uh, a youth input in the development of the app. And a novel approach with JoyPop is that we really are focusing resilient on resilience, your capacity to adapt and resources. And the app provides you with many resources in one spot. Uh, so that um, we do have the situation where there are actually a huge number of apps available in app stores, but very little um, evidence for these apps. They have perhaps high face validity, but they aren't um, clear in terms of their um, effectiveness uh, or impacts. Um, they're at the stage of if they do have research or feasibility and user acceptability. And that, so we have a very low level of uh, research. So that's really been our focus with the JoyPop app is that it's um, uh, an iOS app at this point in time, we would like to move towards an Android as the evidence accumulates. It's based on positive psychology, which makes it very unique in the app space in that we understand particularly where youth have uh, adverse childhood experiences and adversity, adverse contexts that um, the research tells us, uh, both from emotions theory and information processing theory, that there may be a bias towards negative affect or negative information, that that gets preferential processing in our minds, and that it's actually effort to notice positives and to engage in positive um, activities. That idea uh, in depression around mood congruent processing, if you've heard that term. And we've designed it with a trauma and violence informed approach, wanting to make sure that anyone engaging in this app, that we're not doing any harm and there's uh, not unintended negative consequences. So we've built that into various features. Um, for example, the journaling feature, that data stays in the phone. It's never transmitted so that it we're really in enhancing the privacy and confidentiality aspects. And um, as people probably are aware of the trauma and violence informed care approach, the real emphasis is on safety so that this is a safe place to, to interact, that the app itself feels safe and that there's safety measures and that um, there's um, no, you know, we're, we're making sure that there's no potential for re-victimization experiences and that within the app, you have a choice and voice. And our continuous improvement model is really about collaborating with users. So the, uh, the idea of what resilience is, I mean, people have their uh, notions of something like bouncing back, uh, overcoming adversity. But when it comes to youth with adverse experiences, it really is about offering actual resources, that that is an important opportunity for youth to match their inner resourcefulness with external resources. And that includes a you as therapist being an external resource, the access to intervention, um, as well as uh, something like an app. 
Some of our research, as mentioned in the intro on the maltreatment and adolescent pathway study, which was conducted with youth who were receiving services from child welfare, uh, what we found is that um, you know, emotion regulation, and this has been borne out in a great deal of research, is, is really the mediator between adverse experiences and current uh, mental health issues, that the challenge piece is really how to regulate emotions that expand, ex it, it indicates so many things like ability to label emotions, ability to express emotions appropriately, um, having uh, uh, the capacity to respond um, with your emotions or even talk about emotions, acknowledge emotions. Um, what we do for resilience, we've got, you know, looking at our research, we see that there's uh, four kind of key issues when you have adversity, making sense of your experience. And in the Joy Put app, Pop app that could be journaling and understanding emotions. Uh, your social connectedness is a really important piece of resilience. And so we have a circle of trust as well as a drop down menu on every screen of helplines, 24 7 helplines. The way of visioning so that we know, for instance, with depression, if you're able to have a future orientation, you, um, you know, that's, that's part of a healthy movement forward. And so within Joy Pop, we have creative expressions, we have an art draw um, uh, uh, feature, and that actually intervening so that you can take action when you notice things. So we have strategic gaming, a Tetris-like game, a deep breathing, and sleep hygiene, and sleep ease. So these are the various uh, Joy Pop features, some I've just mentioned. Um, mood ratings, journaling, sleepies, art, this Tetris-like game, square moves, a calendar when you do journaling. And um, I'm handing it over then at this point to Ashlyn to chat about the research. Thanks so much, Chris. Um, just before we get to that, I just am gonna take us through a short video that goes over all of the features of the JoyPop app in more detail so you can get a really good sense of what we're talking about when we present some data about the utility of this app. When you open JoyPop, this is your landing page. Happiness starts with you. This means that your actions can shape your feelings. It does not mean that you are expected to be happy all the time, no one is. It means that happiness belongs to you, and you can feel more happiness by doing things. JoyPop provides activities that can help you build resilience and de-stress your mind and body. Because we need to be mindful of safety, there's a phone icon that will take you to help right away. Press the top right corner and get a drop-down menu of 24-7 hotlines. Reaching out is resilience, so connecting when you feel challenged by an event, issue, mental health symptoms, suicidality, or emergency is just a few taps away. Using JoyPop for 15 minutes a day, seven times a week, equates to one hour and 45 minutes of practicing your resilience strategies and healthy coping mechanisms. Investing in yourself is an investment that always pays off. Opening up the calendar feature shows you the current date and any previous journal entries that you may have written in the past. It is a smooth sliding feature to scroll through the different months and you can click on a date to view the previous journal entry Rate My Mood first gives you a prompt to indicate how happy you're feeling. If you're not feeling 100% happy, then you drag the color wave to adjust to what you're feeling and hit save. If you rate above 50% happy, you will get a resilience message. However, if you rate below 50% happy, then you'll be asked how you're feeling, whether it's mad, sad, or having a meh kind of day. Select which emotions you are feeling, and again, place the color wave on a scale of 0 to 100%. Then, you'll be prompted to go to activities within JoyPop to boost your mood or distract any negative emotions with four different activities to choose from. The journal exercise shows the entry date as well as a prompt to get your creative writing process started. It provides a title and a written text area where you can decide what to write down. You can also use the journal to track your moods on a daily basis and notice any patterns that are present. 
The Circle of Trust is a very helpful and significant feature where you can input six different reliable, trustworthy contacts. You provide their name, phone number, and whether they are friend, family, professional, or elder mentor. The information will be saved in the Circle of Trust and you'll be able to contact them at any time you want or whenever they are available. The activities offer a variety of exercises to calm you down, help you sleep, be creative, and play games. Square Moves is a Tetris-like game where different shaped blocks fall from the top of the screen and you must rotate them by tapping on the shape and move them by swiping left or right on the shape to form a full line at the bottom of the screen. Once you have formed a complete line, the blocks will pop up and disappear and your score will increase. The breathing exercise feature provides different forms of breathing. It starts by providing information on how to relax and prepare your body and mind to get the best results for either breathing technique. Each exercise comes with prompts and visual cues. Balanced breathing is to bring the body to a state of equilibrium and relaxation breathing is meant to help you feel more relaxed. Follow the prompts and the animations on screen to complete the exercise. The art feature allows you to be as creative and as imaginative as possible. You can draw and write out anything you want and erase a mistake or hit the start over button to have a fresh new canvas. Sleep Ease is helpful for when you're ready to prepare your body for sleep. Use this feature when you would like to unwind for a nap or a good night's rest. Similar to the breathing exercises, there is a display showing an effective way to fall asleep easier. Once you've read that, you can choose between two different relaxing water sounds and set a timer for how long you like to listen to them. Click Start and try to ease your body into sleep as the sound plays in the background. Play around with the features and activities in Joypop. Get into the routine of book ending your day with Joypop. Pop in anytime. Joypop is there to support your wellness and maximize your resilience. And it all starts with you. So enjoy. Okay. So before we get to our research results, we just have a couple more poll questions to get your thoughts and perspective on where you think we're at in terms of research supporting mobile mental health apps. So the first question there, do you think the majority of available mobile mental health apps available to youth are evidence-based? All right, so I think uh, Chris probably gave you the heads up on this one that, yes, you're right. Um, as many people have said, no, the majority of mobile mental health-based apps um, available to youth are not well researched and are can be considered not necessarily evidence based and we'll we'll get to some of that um, and the difference with the joy pop app shortly. And the next poll question. So what proportion of mobile mental health apps for anxiety and depression do you think have research to support the claims that they make about their effectiveness? So the answer is less than 5%. So um, a recent meta-analysis, a review was done uh, looking at apps that were designed or are suggested to support or improve anxiety and depression. And only about 3.4% of them actually had data to support those claims that they make on their website or that they make you know, through the Google Play Store or um, the iPhone App Store. Um, so we see a lot of apps that talk about addressing mental health uh, difficulties, anxiety, depression. Um, but in terms of the research to support that, and especially research done by a separate group. So a research um, done by those who weren't intimately involved in designing the app, we see very few um, studies that have been done to support these mobile mental health apps. So yeah, just sort of a caveat with anyone who is recommending apps to your clients or the, the families that you work with is to 
try to have a look at the literature and research if it's available to support those apps. Um, and if you're not a researcher yourself, you know, maybe you can consult with one um, and be able to look up through various databases, you know, is there research evidence to support this and not just the statements that are made on the websites of the app, because those aren't always based in high quality research and evidence. Okay, so now we will get to our research. Um, so I really appreciate the opportunity to talk about some of our work. Um, and I think it is important to note that with our team, there really is a differentiation between sort of the development team and the research team. So um, my team has been more involved on the research end of things, didn't have any involvement in terms of the development of the app. Um, we have no, uh, we don't receive any compensation for talking about the app, using the app um, for our research related to the app. And I think that's a difference as well with the Joypop app that it, with other apps, you don't often see that. It's usually the folks that are making money from the app who are promoting the app. So um, we we've thought it's really important and speaks to the quality of evidence to be able to have separate teams working on development and separate teams working on the research to support the apps. So in our first study, we evaluated the impact of using the Joypop app among youth who had recently undergone the transition to university. So these are 17, 17, 18 year olds. Um, and while we know this transition can be really exciting and is filled with lots of new opportunities for youth, it can also present with a lot of uncertainty, new pressures and expectations, maybe a loss of typical social support um, and increased stress for youth. So this makes it a really important time to evaluate the impact of an intervention that's designed to build resilience and to build positive coping strategies that can not only be used when the youth is starting university, but hopefully throughout the rest of their educational journey. So in our study, participants were asked to use the app for four weeks, um, ideally in the morning and in the evenings to sort of bookend their day as the video talked about. Um, but then they're welcome to use it at any other times throughout the day whenever they thought it would be helpful. Uh, and we did not specify which features of the app or how much of each feature they should use. Um, that that's sort of a benefit to the Joypop app that users can really figure out which features speak to them the best and, and figure out which ones are most helpful to them. So they're free to sort of explore and use as much of any of the features as they wished. So in addition to using the app, our participants completed measures of resilience and resilience related outcomes and mental health at baseline after two weeks of using the app and after four weeks of using the app. Um, at baseline, they also provided some demographic data and information pertaining to their exposure to adversity during childhood. And we had hypothesized that those who had experienced more adversity, they would show a greater rate of change in resilience and resilience related outcomes. As this group of participants, they would have more to gain from an intervention that is focused on boosting or bolstering those self regulatory or emotion regulation skills. So while participants were involved in the study, uh, they used the app on average 20 of the possible 28 days. And we saw that retention throughout our study was good with 89% of those who enrolled in the study completing the midpoint questionnaires and 81% presenting, um, 81 completing the post-app questionnaire. So kind of sticking it through the entire four weeks of the study. So what we found when we look at the impact of the app usage across time, we saw improvements across participants in emotion regulation and also in a reduction in depressive symptoms. So this was consistent with what we had hoped and what we had predicted would happen, um, that using the app would be associated with benefits in terms of resilience related measures and mental health. In our sample, when we, when we look at the um, the baseline data around exposure to childhood adversity, we found that the majority reported experiencing at least one adverse childhood experience, which um, we assessed things like exposure to abuse, neglect, or any kind of household dysfunction. And in our sample, close to 30% actually reported experiencing four or more of these adverse childhood experiences. So when we look at the sort of interaction between adverse childhood experiences and use of the app, with emotion regulation, we see that there was a significant interaction so that the rate of improvement in emotion regulation difficulty was, a, was greater for those who had exposure to more adverse childhood experiences. So if you look at this chart, 
what it is on the left is this is the difficulties in emotion regulation. This is our measure. And if you look at the slope of the line, for those, the blue, blue dots, that's for those who reported a score or adverse childhood experience score of zero. And you see that the slope of that line is it's still going down. So you're still seeing improvements in difficulties related to emotion regulation, but the, the slope or the, the level of steepness of that line isn't as extreme as it is for those who um, were in the 90th percentile or those who had experienced six adverse childhood experiences. So you see that improvement is a lot more drastic and they're, they're showing a lot more benefit in terms of reduction of difficulties in emotion regulation. So that was sort of the evidence from our quantitative study. And although it's important to establish the effectiveness of an app via those quantitative or outcome-based measures, it's also important to, to look at sort of users' experiences with an app. Because regardless of, you know, what our outcomes show, if someone doesn't like the app, they're not going to use it, no matter how much data they have to show that this is going to be beneficial. So getting this user perspective can really lead to insights into pattern of use and the likelihood that someone will continue using an app over time. So we conducted a qualitative study to explore some users' experiences with the app and their perspective on its utility. Um, our semi-structured interviews were used to ask people about how frequently they use the app, what were their most and least used features and the reasons why, what were their most and least helpful features, what were any barriers that they found to using the app, what were some facilitators of ongoing use and continuation, and then what were some recommendations for improvement. So as Chris talked about, one kind of um, important um, kind of driver of this app development is around continual improvement and we need to gather users feedback in order to know what areas need to be um, improved. So overall, the features that were rated as most used were the rate my mood, so kind of that the bar where you slide up the um, rating the mood up and down for happiness, sadness, uh, anger, and sort of that meh feeling, the journaling feature and the square moves feature. The most helpful features were reported to be the rate my mood feature, journaling, and the breathing exercises. When we look at themes, so factors that seem to facilitate, facilitate participants' use of the app, including having this opportunity to self-monitor. So people talked about that this actually, this really gave them a chance to sort of check in, reflect on how they were feeling, monitor their mood, and that they found that this was, this encouraged them to come back to the app and use the app more in the future. They also like the prompts that were included in the app. So on the journaling page, having prompts about things to write about, they really liked and found that this facilitated their use. Um, and then they also found that the prompts around using it in the morning and in the afternoon helped create a sense of routine and sort of checking in with themselves and bookending their day with this sort of resilience building routine. Uh, for barriers, people talked about that their student lifestyle, so being busy, um, seemed to interfere or having competing demands interfere with using this intervention. Others felt that having only a set number of features um, deterred from their use and not being able to edit um, their journal responses, not being able to go back and change them over time may have, for a few people, deterred them from using uh, the app. When participants talked about the outcomes associated with the app, um, many talked about how it increased their awareness of their emotions, it helped them be better able to tell what am I feeling um, in a given moment. It gave them that opportunity to check in with themselves, provided a helpful distraction. So we know distraction can be a useful um, emotion regulation technique. Um, we don't want to see people using distraction all the time, but there are times when distraction is helpful and necessary. Um, so the app provided exercises or activities that can be used um, to facilitate distraction. And then last, emotional control. So not only helping be aware of emotions, but also helping to manage them or control them, especially the ones that the more negative emotions participants reported feeling better control over things like anger and sadness. Her recommendations, like with many apps, if you look at sort of feedback on, on app stores, um, most participants often want additional features. Um, in our study, we also found that participants were talked about different ways to enhance the features. So talked about personalization that could be made, to being able to choose different colors in the app, um, having personalization based on their location, they thought might be interesting. 
So there was a lot of good recommendations for us to consider. And those recommendations, the app development team um, has integrated into subsequent revisions of the app. So just gonna leave you with a few quotes from uh, participants in our qualitative studies. So one person saying, you know, definitely help me figure out my feelings, help me to relate to my mood. Often I would feel better afterwards because I, I'd be like, okay, I know how to deal with this now rather than just sitting there and stewing and not knowing what to do. Um, someone else said it, it kind of distracted me from everything that was going on in, in my head and gave me something else to focus that attention on. I'm just going to turn it back to Chris, who will summarize sort of where we're at and, and where um, so the group is going in terms of future research. Thanks very much, Ashlyn. And uh, thank you for those who've entered questions into the chats. There's a lot of different ways we can go forward with the Joy Pop app. We are wanting to do uh, specific research studies with specific um, uh, contexts uh, and uh, populations. So Ashlyn will be uh, working with um, youth presenting or uh, for mental health services. Uh, there's an interest in the child welfare community to have this app support the youth in foster care and who are transitioning out of child welfare. Uh, as mentioned, we continue to work with uh, Indigenous groups to create an app that is more uh, suited to that um, uh, group uh, with the inclusion of say more visuals, less text and um, specific uh, notions that are, are helpful, like as mentioned, you know, uh, coming together to have a good mind. Uh, some of the suggestions in the chat uh, what were around, you know, what about exercise? Uh, that's obviously evidence-based practice. Um, so we're looking at um, uh, really what the youth are uh, directing us towards. And maybe Ashlyn, you can let me know because when they were talking about features uh, on our end in our consultations, um, activities uh, weren't specifically, uh, exercise wasn't specifically mentioned, although for Indigenous youth, you know, being directed to, you know, uh, connecting to the land in various ways uh, was mentioned. Uh, was that something that you found in the qualitative study? Yeah, no one specifically mentioned wanting features related to movement. Um, but I think when we think about using this app, you know, this won't replace all mental health services, right? So I think it can be used as a tool and that's where our next research is going is figuring out what's the best way to use this within a clinical context. So figuring out, can this be a, something that people use before they get into sort of traditional mental health counseling, um, like working with a, a mental health worker or a psychologist or social worker, can they use it as a preparatory skill to start talking about and thinking about their emotions, or can they use it as an adjunct to typical services? So if they're working with a therapist, um, can a therapist or a clinician use this to say, you know, here's a resource that you can work on in terms of journaling or evaluating your mood. And then that would be in the context of additional interventions. Like if someone was experiencing depression, then an intervention focusing more on behavioral activation and that movement and exercise piece. So yeah, I think it's a really good question of how this can integrate with other existing base evidence-based interventions, um, whether or not we integrate every intervention or technique into the app, um, but it can be used, you know, within the context of that larger circle of um, care and, and circle of support for the clients. Uh, yeah, and uh, some of the ways other people have thought about it, um, for instance, some people see this as a good fit for when youth are, are waiting in, their, in an emergency room, um, whether they're waiting for mental health services or other uh, health services. Um, that, as you know, emergency rooms can be kind of um, challenging, especially if youth um, uh, have traumatic symptoms. 
Um, it's hard to uh, manage in a weight room without some something to capture your attention. And um, uh, so that has been also suggested. And in the chats, the suggestion around might be interesting if caregivers were using it and then the youth was using it or other siblings and see how that might create kind of a family-wide e better emotion regulation. So that's a really interesting idea as well. Um, I think their reading level uh, was, I think, at grade six, if I'm not mistaken, grade four or six. Uh, this is something that the, uh, the app developer side of things, uh, they uh, managed a lot of app best practices. ClearBridge Mobile is the app developer. Uh, who are, um, you know, among top app developers in Canada. And so their wealth of expertise on what makes a good user experience and uh, what uh, supports um, positive engagement with the app was all their, all their uh, set of knowledge was brought into the development of this app. Um, we were really fortunate to be continuing to work with them as we do iterations of improvements based on our user feedback. So thank you for all the questions coming in. Um, we do, uh, as mentioned, we do do updates about the Joy Pop app on both the website youthresilience.net as well as in our social media. And Ashlyn and myself, um, are both active at Dr. Weckerly, uh, myself and Ashlyn, you might want to mention your social medias. I think it's just my name. <laughs> at Dr. Ashton Mushbosh and at the Co Coping Lab. Yeah. Excellent. I, I think we're, we're wrapping up the content presentation portion of our webinar today. And just thank you both so very much. Uh, it's been extremely informative. Um, and we do have uh, some questions in the Q&A box now and, and some of my own as well. So I was wondering if we could just get right into them, uh, knowing that time is of the essence. All right. Um, first here, just kind of overarching, um, how does emotional regulation play a role in youth wellness? Uh, yeah, Ashley, do you want to take that? Sure. Um, yeah, it's a great question. I think with emotion regulation, we know that this is a core kind of difficulty that's transdiagnostic. So if a youth is presenting with depressive symptoms or anxiety symptoms or trauma symptoms or substance use, a lot of research and I think clinical practice would show that a core kind of difficulty or deficit related to that is difficulties around figuring out emotions and regulating those emotions. So, um, you know, with, with substance use, you may see that substances are used as a means to regulate emotions or with depression, there's a difficulty around um, managing kind of overwhelming emotions of sadness or hopelessness and then anxiety, emotions of fear or nervousness. So I think when we, when we look at like, what is the best use of almost like best bang for the buck when you're trying to intervene on a level that may have the biggest impact across a number of domains, emotion regulation, difficulties and skills seems to be a really important area to go for. And I think it's really validating for youth as well. So that, you know, there's not something fundamentally wrong with me. It's there, there are these skills that maybe I didn't have the opportunity throughout development to learn, especially for those who might've had early adversity, early adverse experiences, might've been faced with abuse or neglect and not had opportunities or models of how to develop adaptive emotion regulation skills. So this is something that anyone can address and anyone can um, work to improve. So I think when we're wanting to improve wellness across a number of domains, this seems like a, a really positive target um, to address a lot of different areas. Right. Yeah, and just the idea that this is helping uh, a person to become more reflective rather than reactive. Mm -hmm. right. Yes, that's definitely a very, uh, very good comprehensive answer. And I think a concept that's overarching in terms of challenges that one may face. Um, sort of to build on that, at the beginning of the presentation, you gave a really great definition of resilience. Uh, but specifically for our audience, how would you say that resilience is defined for youth in pediatric care? 
Right. So youth and pediatric care, that spans a wide group of youth, youth who are dealing with chronic health issues, uh, youth who are dealing with more something more acute, like a cancer diagnosis, um, eating disorders, uh, diabetes, uh, that kind of stuff, as well as, uh, you know, receiving surprising diagnoses if they have a, a genetic uh, condition. So the resilience will span a great range. Um, if you're coping with chron anything chronic, you've already developed resilience because you've had to deal with this. You've found some ways, but there's no ceiling to resilience. So you can always boost those skills up. Um, and uh, so it really is around how you receive the diagnosis, the supports that are in place around, again, at that point, processing emotionally what that uh, diagnosis may mean and uh, just reinforcing the positive coping that has happened in the past because that's something in their back pocket that will continue going forward as well as picking up kind of new um, uh, skills. And so the idea of resilience that is a, maybe a little bit different, what we're trying to emphasize in Joy Pop is that this is day-to-day -day resilience. On a daily basis, you have choices to be to made in your mindset, in your behavior, how you manage emotions, you know, tricks to support you back into a more positive, productive mood space, how you, you know, how you allow for negative emotionality, how you reach out. Um, so we like to focus on the day-to-day -day, uh, resilience. And I just add too that I, I think there's been a shift in conceptualization around resilience over the last number of years um, from being this, you know, unique characteristic of invulnerability that, you know, if someone has it, then they're going to get through a difficult experience better to now viewing resilience more as a sort of multifaceted of a large number of skills like Christine was talking about that can be boosted and can, can you know, be improved with the support. Um, and I think with with apps or interventions like Joy Pop, it can be helpful to figure out like where are there areas where maybe I'm not tapping into resilience as much. So you may have one youth who kind of is only internally um, trying to rely on themselves, like trying to kind of grin and bear it and get through things with themselves only and not relying on a support network. Whereas with Joy Pop, we would view trying to connect with others, relying on others for social support is an aspect of resilience. So maybe looking into different domains of resilience to um, see even better improvements in terms of mental health and well-being. Right. Makes complete sense. And, and I really like the lens of kind of day-to-day -day functioning um, and, and how you look at things that way. I see it as a very integrated approach. Um, you, you certainly did a, a good job of responding to some of the questions that came through in the chat, but one I wanted to probe a little bit about was um, someone did write, I work with youth that still reside with their parent or parents, and have you looked at the family perspective and whether that perspective has seen positive results from youth using the app? Um, so you did comment very well in this, but I was wondering uh, if either of you had anything else that you'd like to elaborate on in terms of that. Yeah, it's a really good question and sort of one that we are hoping to explore further um, in our upcoming research. So in Thunder Bay, we're launching research like right away um, with two primary mental health agencies for Indigenous and non-Indigenous youth. And we're going to have youth using the app, both those who are waiting for services and also those who are already in services. Um, and then we're going to be, it's kind of that quantitative, qualitative mix of, of research. Um, so we're going to look at outcomes. We're also going to look at youth perspective and also clinicians perspective. And sort of as we got that comment, I, I was thinking it would be helpful also to get parent or caregiver perspective around, you know, what kind of improvements did you see or, or no improvements did you see um, with your youth, your child when they were using this app. As of right now, we're focused on youth in sort of the 12 to 18 age group. Um, but it's not to say that this app could not be used. And I think, you know, this is a potential future research direction around um, looking at younger kids and, and having parents use the app and, and figure out, like, can parents use it maybe with younger kids or can they use it themselves to support them better in helping their younger kids with their developing emotion regulation and, and resilience building strategies. 
And that is a suggestion that also came from our Indigenous uh, advisory group around, you know, having parents try out this app and seeing if, you know, again, with younger kids, maybe age 12, whether that would be something that the parents would be interested in supporting their youth in using. Mm -hmm. right. Perfect, makes complete sense and, and actually builds really nicely into our next question. Um, so I'm curious if any work has been done to create a joy pop or any sort of equivalent for younger children um, that are building resilience or one for adults that may be suffering from burnout. So whether or not it's joy pop branded, are there any applications that you're aware of or maybe would even recommend for those populations? Yeah, so we are within our Indigenous group uh, working with younger children up to, uh, to age 12. We don't have any plans right now to go to say age six, like the younger age. Um, I think adults might be able to try out this app and they may find that it works with them. I mean, whenever we present it, adults think about themselves using it. So um, it may be uh, useful for adults and certainly we've done work with young adults. Um, so uh, yeah, I don't know if uh, Ashlyn would like to add to that. No, yeah, I think it's, there's so many <laughs> directions we could go in it, you know, with research things take time. And, and I think these are all really great suggestions on, you know, next steps and hopefully we'll get there. Yeah. yeah. Sorry. Sorry. I was going to say we're always looking for partners too. So if people are interested in having their environment be a research site and they're interested to seek funding, uh, we're very, we're very uh, happy to, to, uh, partner right now there's a group in the UK there's a group in the US working uh, doing their own uh, research uh, I should mention that the app comes in French as well um, as well as English so uh, you know we're very open if people want to take this on and do research with it we're very happy to extend the uh, research group mm -hmm. Sounds great. No, that's um, wonderful to hear. And I can certainly appreciate the research process and, and how much can fit into the scope of one study and, and one team at a time. Um, sort of an app specific question. And you began to touch on this a little bit with language. Um, can users use voice recording into the app journal or other elements of the app rather than typing? Or are there any other existing accessibility features? Yeah, so definitely the, the uh, microphone feature can be used. Emojis can be used. Um, we have the art draw. Uh, so that's um, uh, Ashton. Would you? Yeah, I think it's it's quite accessible, and you know, given that it, the reading level, um, and we try to make it quite young, so that most most youth are who are able to read um, would be able to understand. And they're kind of, you know, with the mood rating feature, it's it's picture based and movement based rather than having to, you know, rate your mood on a scale with a number. Um, so I think a lot of the features have been designed with that in mind um, to try to increase accessibility for sure. And one of the features that we are looking at, because again, this came from the Indigenous work we're doing, is to have the audio component. So they may not have to read happiness starts with you that you could produce uh, press an uh, you know an audio button to have it uh, come vo vocally. So that's something that we're looking uh, to a future improvement. Excellent. Definitely uh, makes it a great way to be accessible and relevant to a variety of youth audiences. So that's very good to hear. Um, another person had one app specific question, and they they wrote, "I could see this working well with a DBT focused treatment approach." and as an option instead of diary card tracking, and also in facilitating regular use of new skills. Is there any way to personalize to perhaps add some additional skills depending on the current therapy focus? Uh, Ashley, do you want to take that? Sure. Yeah, it's a, it's a really great comment. Um, I agree, I'm a DBT therapist as well, and I, uh, yeah, I can definitely see the relevance, especially for those who may be struggling with like a traditional diary card and all the different aspects. And this may be a way to sort of ease into that uh, approach of starting to track things. And I think it can be used, you know, if, you, if you're in a setting where um, 
you're okay to be sort of emailing or texting with clients, then they could take screenshots of their mood rating or screenshots of their journal entries and then be sending them to their therapist, similar to how you would be bringing in like a paper copy of a diary card. Um, in terms of the personalization, I think that's where, you know, we would need to work with a team who maybe had interest in creating some personalizations and providing some feedback to the team. And then we would work with you to sort of help evaluate that. Um, as of right now, there, and maybe Chris, you want to talk about this more, but there, there isn't really options to like add on features, delete features. It's sort of set unless, you know, you're working with the team and, and want to create like your own build basically, um, or, or a, a replication of the app with additional features. Yeah, absolutely. That's why we encourage research because to do any new feature costs about 50k. And this is a, a, a research venture. Um, and uh, so we're open to any kind of app if people want to get engaged in, in creating uh, funding for that and doing research on it. Excellent. All right. I just have one final question here, again, being cognizant of time. Um, it's sort of overarching. You've left us many words of advice, I think, today. But overall, what recommendations would you give to professionals seeking to build a mobile mental health app? Or how can they ensure that it is built in a way that will be effective and evidence informed? Well, I think the first thing is to understand from the clinical research what strategies um, have shown to be effective. And then the second piece is to make sure that you don't have unintended negative consequences. So we've been cautious, for instance, in the, our mood ratings in doing a graph, because if people are, are consistently rating their negative moods uh, highly, then you're just giving them feedback that's not necessarily uplifting so that's why we, we focus on positives and that, uh, you know, have people connect to and pay attention to pauses, which is especially important if they're in a state of negative affect, um, anxiety or depression or panic uh, or trauma symptomatology. Uh, so I think that it's really important that you, you start with the research-based strategies, but also think more broadly around... Uh, you know, how you create safety in the app. Mm -hmm. Dr. Muskosh, anything final to add? Yeah, I would just say um, it's a long process. Um, and it, 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 for anyone wanting to develop a, an app from scratch, I think it's, it's a long process and a, there's so many costs involved, which was a real shock to me. Um, and, and I would just say, so if you're not able to go down the path of creating an app yourself, if that's not within the scope of your role, um, just be critical of what, what else exists. Like, I'm always shocked with the things that are, have been incorporated into institutions, like, for example, post-secondary institutions, you know, apps or programs that have been incorporated, you know, across the country, and you look them up, and there's very little evidence to support them. So always being critical of of programs and apps that exist and searching for that evidence base um, or, or consulting with, with others who might be able to support you in figuring out, is there a strong evidence base behind this? And not always just relying on the flyer that comes across through your email, because of course the people who are trying to sell something are going to say that it's evidence-based, but looking to the actual, like are there published articles on this? Is there an independent research team evaluating these programs and these apps? so that we can actually feel confident that they're not only informed by evidence, they're created with evidence, trauma-informed, you know, they're created with best practice, but also that there's evaluative research to show that these lead to positive outcomes and don't cause any harm. Um, I think it's really important as a clinician. Yes, certainly makes good sense to be uh, always reflective and, and aware and informed of, of what's going on and what's informing your applications or best practices. Mm -hmm. um, all right, well, being cognizant of time once again, um, and also we are at the end of our list of questions. I guess that is the end of our presentation today. So thank you so very much, Dr. Weckerly and Dr. Musquash for sharing your time and expertise with us. It's so very appreciated. And um, thank you to all the members and other attendees for spending time with us today. We hope and believe that you are departing with some practical knowledge to bring back to your own organization. 
As a few updates, Children's Healthcare Canada has now moving forward identified theme months in our Spark Learning calendar, which with next month being vaccine themed. On October 27th, we will be joined by Dr. Stephen Friedman and Jim Kellner, who will present on COVID and Kids, the case for vaccinating younger children in Canada. Children's Healthcare Canada is also pleased to co-host with London Children's Hospital our 2021 annual conference, which will be taking place virtually from November 22nd to 26th. The theme this year is From Crisis to Catalyst, the next chapter for children's healthcare, and registration is now open. Please visit www.childrenshealthcarecanada.ca for more information or to register. It's always great if you can catch us live as your questions and comments really enrich the discussion. But if you can't, the recordings of these sessions are always made available after the fact on our Knowledge Exchange Network. So thank you again very much for joining us today. And thanks to Dr. Weckerly and Dr. Musquash for this presentation. And hopefully we see many of you back here on October 27th or sooner. Bye everyone. Bye.